Hi everybody, this is Ashley Moretti again. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions for the Erie Canal Museum in downtown Syracuse, New York. Uh, we're still doing uh, recordings of some of our programs and events because the museum is still closed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the state's guidelines for non-essential businesses. Uh, so we've postponed or canceled things and, and we're doing videos just like this one. Um, the reason that this video exists is because of the closure, so if you enjoy this video and you're enjoying the other material that the museum is putting together, we would be so grateful to you if you would become a member of our museum or make a tax-deductible donation to our annual fund. You can help to ensure the future of the Erie Canal Museum by contributing. I'll put a link in the comment section for this video so that you can do that. So let's get started. Uh, as you can see, today uh, we're going to talk about the Erie Canal and New York's glass industry as well as uh, New York canals in general in the glass industry. Um, I think this is a pretty interesting talk and an interesting topic. Uh, I originally gave this talk at the museum back in October of 2017, which doesn't seem like it should be almost three years ago, but here we are in May 2020, and I guess it was. All right, um, so marbles, just like the ones pictured here, are one of the many, many things in our lives that are made from glass. Thanks for listening to me talk today. Um, what are we going to learn? We're going to learn about glass itself, what it is, and how it is made, so you get a little science lesson along with your history. I'm going to give you a little history of the American glass making industry, and then we're going to focus in and talk about glass in New York State, and more specifically, a few glass companies that were influenced by New York canals and the great changes that they brought to the Empire State. So let's get started. So what is glass? You know, glass actually exists in nature as obsidian, and that's a naturally occurring volcanic glass that is formed as an igneous rock. When lava from an erupting volcano cools rapidly with minimal crystal growth, obsidian is formed. Uh, glass has actually been made by people for over 4,000 years. Most glass consists of minerals heated until they melt, and they are then cooled at a rate that prevents them from resuming the crystalline structure of the original ingredients. Hot glass is a liquid, which becomes viscous as it cools, and when completely cooled, it is rigid with the properties of a solid, but because of the way it is cooled, it keeps the random structure of a liquid. As a result, glass can be softened by reheating and shaped and reshaped this way repeatedly. Glass is a really strange material. For a long time, it baffled scientists who could find no crystalline structure within it. It is brittle, but it's also durable and flexible, and in the hands of an experienced craftsman or craftswoman, it is almost infinitely malleable. So there are three different parts to uh, making glass, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, primary production of glass consists of ingredients being melted to make raw glass. Secondary production is when raw glass is melted again to make objects and sometimes decorated with molten glass before being cooled. This process is called annealing. And tertiary production, this is when an annealed object is decorated, such as by engraving. Most, this is most efficient when the artisan has a convenient source of freshly annealed objects, known as blanks, to be decorated. So in primary production, uh, traditionally the three ingredients of glass consist of silica, which is usually in the form of sand, soda or potash, this acts as a flux and lowers the temperature at which the sand melts, uh, and lime, this is calcium oxide, which gives stability to an otherwise unstable combination. So glass is a chemical cocktail. Um, we have here photos of sand, uh, natron and potash, uh, that's sand at the top left and natron at the top right, and then at the bottom that's potash. Sand is readily available in most places. Uh, soda com comes from the mineral natron or potash. Any variety of mined or manufactured salts containing potassium in a water-soluble form, which can be derived from plants growing in salty environments. In Europe, for example, potash was made by burning beech leaves or ferns and then soaking the ashes in water. Calcium oxide was an essential component, but oddly, it seems to have been added inadvertently as an impurity either in the silica, sand collected on the seashore might contain seashells, or in the soda, plants growing in soil derived from limestone may contain calcium. The colors of glass can be one of its most beautiful properties. The addition of oxides give glass the color or remove unwanted colors caused by impurities in basic ingredients. For example, uh, if you add cadmium sulfide, you end up with yellow glass. Gold chloride will give you red, cobalt oxide gives you blue-violet, chromic oxide gives you emerald green, uranium oxide gives you yellow and green, nickel oxide gives you violet, and iron oxide gives you shades of greens and browns. Of course, in order to make the glass, these ingredients need to be melted together. The temperatures required for this are extreme. Uh, 1,000 to 1,100 degrees Celsius, or uh, 1,800 to 2,050 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Glass making began in pre-Roman times in Western Asia, and in this area and also in the Mediterranean, the furnaces that could reach these temperatures were small, and not a lot of glass could be produced. Ergo, glass objects were rare and were highly prized. Glass blowing was discovered in the early to mid-first century BCE. Um, this transformed glass making. Blowing into a mass of molten glass on the end of a tube, it can be inflated. Glassware could be made quickly and inexpensively, and the demand for it increased. Furnaces with greater melting capacity were therefore needed. So before glass blowing, there were several ways to shape the glass. You could mold glass. Um, this would have glass being poured into open molds. You could use the lost wax process. Uh, a desired object would be modeled in wax, which would then be coated in a fine clay, leaving a few small holes. Clay-covered model was then heated, and the clay becomes earthenware, and the wax melts and runs out. The earthenware then was a mold, the interior of which was the exact size and shape of the wax model. When using the mold, raw materials could be introduced in powder form and melted right inside the mold. Most of the earliest glass pieces were formed by a technique unique to glass making, core forming. Uh, core would be made from animal dung mixed with clay, sand, and water, attached to a metal rod and modeled to the shape and size of the interior of a glass vessel. The core was then covered with glass, either by dipping it in a crucible of molten glass or by coating it with powdered glass in a liquid medium and heating the powder until it fused. The decoration would be added by applying trails of molten glass and dragging them up and down to create feathered patterns. At the end of the process, the core would be removed from the interior with a metal tool. Core forming was invented in the 16th century BCE and was used until the discovery of glass blowing 1500 years later. So uh, here's a photo of the core forming process. I just think this is such an interesting piece of history. This photo is a still shot taken from a neat video of core forming that was made by the Getty Museum using footage from the Corning Museum of Glass. So after the annealing process, uh, when the glass was carefully cooled, the glass can be decorated in many different ways. Glass can be painted. You can use enamel, which is powdered glass in different colors suspended in an oily medium. Um, this is applied and then fused to the, the original piece with heat. Uh, you can use cold painting. This is application of paint, such as other artists might use. Simplest kind of engraving would be scratching surface with a pointed tool. Sometimes glass etching tools use diamond tips, but other minerals with hardness greater than 7 on the Mohs scale also work well. Uh, you can stipple your glass. This is when you use an engraving tool to tap on the surface of the glass, and the design is made of the marks left. You can engrave your glass. This is when you hold a glass object against a rotating stone or a copper wheel fed with an abrasive slurry. Uh, you can cut it. Remove glass from the surface of the object by grinding it with rotating wheels. And then uh, you have a ground surface that uh, ends up being polished to produce a brilliance in the finished piece. And finally, you can etch your glass. This is when you use hydrofluoric acid. Uh, an acid etched, etched ornament is produced by covering the, wax piece, uh, the glass piece with an acid-resistant substance, like a wax, through which the decoration will be scratched. The object is immersed in the acid, which then works on the exposed surface areas. So there's a lot of history to pick through for glass, as you can see here. There's over 4,000 years of history. So in the interest of brevity, we're going to go forward in time to the American era of glass making. The first glass company in the U.S. was, in, was founded in Jamestown, Virginia in 1608. It was not successful, and it closed within a year. This was intended to supply the colony with necessities like bottles and window glass. Um, this was also attempted in Salem, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, and New Amsterdam, which of course became New York City, in the 17th century. None of these companies were successful, and the American colonists who could afford it relied upon European imports. Between 1757 and 1773, George Washington imported 1,200 window panes, 23 dozen pieces of stemware, and other glass objects for use at Mount Vernon. Glass making didn't become established in this country until the second quarter of the 18th century. The first successful glass maker uh, in this country was Caspar Wistar, who was a German immigrant who built a glass factory in Salem County, New Jersey in 1738. The factory was taken over by his son after his death and lasted until 1776. Few other glass companies took hold in this era, but the Revolutionary War disrupted trade and industry to the extent that no American glass company survived. After the war, glass making had to be revived. So what did they make? Uh, made a lot of window glass and bottles. These were standard products of early American glass makers, and they were the mainstay until the early 19th century. Sometimes tableware pieces were made for local markets or for personal use. Personal use items were often made with glass left over at the end of a work shift. In the first half of the 19th century, the U.S. population exploded, going from 5 million people in 1800 to 23 million by 1850. 
this also led to the development of pressed glass in the 1820s. Um, there was a need for more glass. This was easier and faster than glass blowing. It was cheaper than cut glass. Molten glass would be poured into metal molds in a glass press, and the operator pulled a lever which drove the plunger into, a into the glass, forcing it against the sides of the mold. This is a, a cool engraving uh, called uh, Among the Glass Workers. This was drawn by Harry Fenn. Uh, it appeared in the magazine every Saturday on March 18, 1871. So like so much of the history of the Empire State, the history of glass making is linked to canals. So I'm going to talk about two canal towns, Corning, which was situated on the navigable feeder for the Chimung Canal, and Canastota, which was in the middle division of the Erie Canal. So you can't talk about glass in New York without talking about Corning. Like so many New York cities and towns, Corning owes its success to a canal, the Chimung Canal to be specific. This was a lateral canal within the state of New York. The success of the Erie inspired a lot of imitation, and many New York communities also wanted to connect to the Great Lakes. This uh, route was surveyed by James Geddes in 1812. He surveyed again in 1825, at which time the Erie Canal was in its finishing stages, and reported that a canal connecting Seneca Lake and the Chimung River was both possible and practical. It wasn't until 1829 that the state legislature authorized $300,000 for the Canal Commission to build the canal. Construction began in 1830, and the canal was finally opened in 1833. Chimung Canal was 23 miles long from Elmira to Watkins, and the feeder canal from Horseheads to Gibson, just east of Corning, was 16 miles long. It was 42 feet wide at the surface and 26 feet wide at the bottom, and 4.5 and feet deep. The system included 53 locks, and to save money, the decision was made to use wooden locks. This was a decision that they would regret, as they became a chronic problem throughout the canal's history. Wood rotted quickly, and the sides bowed and leaked due to the water pressure. On the first trial of the canal, it was discovered that boats could not get in or out of some of the locks. The engineers, Holmes Hutchinson and Joseph Dana Allen, had to work out a way to reinforce the locks and make them work properly. The canal proved to be very costly. Although the Chimung Canal had been one of the cheapest canals to be built in New York State, much more money was spent on repairs and upkeep than the canal ever returned in toll revenue. Frequent flood damage, rotting wooden locks, and silting in, in of the uh, canal prism led to constant expensive repairs. When a new and faster method of shipping goods became available, the canal's days were numbered. After the Civil War, a lot of the lateral canals were no longer worth the cost of maintaining them. It had become a lot faster to ship things overland via the railroads. The Erie Railroad came to nearby Elmira in 1849 and Chimung Canal ended up closing in 1878. So the city of Corning itself was incorporated in 1890 and became known as the Crystal City with the development of the glass industry. Just east of Corning is Gibson, the site of a feeder for the Chimung Canal, and some of the early prosperity of Corning came as a result of this. The Corning Glass Works, which became Corning Incorporated in 1989, was originally founded in 1851 as the Bay State Glass Company in Somerville, Massachusetts. It later moved to Brooklyn, New York, and became the Brooklyn Flint Glass Works. It moved to its final home of Corning in 1868. Corning itself had an abundant supply of white sand, which is silica with very few impurities, and had Pennsylvania coal fields nearby for fuel and New York canals and nearby railroads for transportation of supplies and finished products. Corning has become known as an innovator in the world of glass and ceramics technology and has developed such products as the glass used in Thomas Edison's light bulb, they were the glass supplier for light bulbs for General Electric after Edison General Electric merged with Thompson Houston Electric Company in 1892. Pyrex, which you may use for baking or food storage, it was introduced in 1908. I love Pyrex. I have a Pyrex measuring cup. I have a whole Pyrex set of food storage uh, containers. I have Pyrex dishes. Pyrex is amazing. Um, Corning is also known for developing uh, the window glass for U.S. manned space vehicles. And uh, they also developed Gorilla Glass, which is in all likelihood what the front of your smartphone is made from. That was originally developed in the 1960s as ChemCore. It was used for commercial and, and industrial applications until the 1990s, and beginning in 2005, it was marked for use in consumer electronics. Corning is also home to the Museum of Glass, which was founded in 1951 and is dedicated to telling the story of glass and features 3,500 years worth of glass history. It seems fitting that this museum would also be a part of Corning's history. Um, they've got this neat glass barge program, which is uh, pretty new for the museum. They just started that a couple of years ago. Uh, they take live glass making demonstrations um, in waterfront communities along historic waterways of New York, including and especially the Erie Canal. Uh, so they've, they've done some, some pretty cool stuff with this the last couple of years. Personally, I have yet to visit the Corning Museum of Glass. It was one of my museums that I wanted to visit in 2020. So 
We'll see how that goes with this whole pandemic thing. So here is a commemorative plate from the museum, my museum's collection. Uh, as you can see, we are going to talk about Canastota next. Uh, so Canastota is well known for window glass and cut glass, and this small village saw its fortunes grow on the basis of the Erie Canal and of two very special glass businesses. Canastota was originally a small clearing in a low swampy forest traversed by Canastota Creek, so it was slower to develop than a lot of other nearby communities. New growth was brought about by the canal project. In 1817, at the start of construction of the canal, a wheat field and four houses were all that Canastota contained. The construction of the canal through the area brought civilization, including municipal authority, churches, and schools. During this period, nationally known amateur canal engineer Nathan Roberts came to Canastota. He was the assistant engineer on the Rome to Rochester stretch of the canal and is also well known for designing and overseeing the construction of the Flight of Five Locks at Lockport. Roberts built a home in Canastota between 1821 and 1825. So as soon as the canal section was opened, uh, boat trade began immediately between Canastota and other villages. In 1881, C. German of Cleveland, New York, traveled to Canastota to discuss locating his glass works there. Glass making began in the village later that year. The company employed about 50 people, and they made window glass. Plate glass windows are made by heating glass by furnace and then flattening it with rollers, then grinding it down and polishing it. Canastota's proximity to Oneida Lake as you can see in this map, was a key selling point as sand from the lake was used as raw material of the glass. Canastota also had a good labor force and a navigable waterway in the form of the canal and railways to bring supplies and provide a connection to a vast market. Boats would be loaded with glass and then glass was peddled along the canal, taking cash or produce in exchange for the product. Business became part of the United Glass Company and the factory was closed with the building remaining idle until 1898, when it was organized into a cooperative company, which lasted until the early 20th century. So here is an image of the Canastota Glass Company in 1884. This is taken from the Erie Canal Museum's collection. So now I need to give you a little history of the American cut glass industry. This originated in 19th century Europe. Many European cutters came here seeking higher wages and the prospect of a new life. England, Ireland, and Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic, uh, they did a lot of straight line designs. European designs were prominent until the 1880s when curved cut was reintroduced. Curved cuts made possible more distinctive designs that could be distinguished from European designs. The American Brilliant Cut Glass movement began in 1876 at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Representatives from eight American glass manufacturers showed off leaded crystal goblets, tumblers, decanters, and serving plates which had been cut by hand on metal, stone, and wooden wheels. This brilliant period lasted from 1876 until the first decade of the 20th century, when changing tastes and less expensive pressed glass, which replicated the look of cut glass, pushed the real thing aside. By 1910, a lot of the cut glass patterns were first pressed and then cut, so they became less costly to produce and less desirable to collectors. During the brilliant period, 1,000 cutting shops were founded to meet the demand. So here's a little business history for you. Uh, the Ideal Cut Glass Company was founded in 1903 in, guess where, Corning. Charles E. Rose founded it after cutting glass in Corning for 17 years. He got some financiers and incorporated the Ideal Cut Glass Company. After a short period of time, the company grew very successful, but its small building location didn't allow for expansion and the hire of more cutters. William Hitchcock owned a wholesale jewelry uh, company here in Syracuse and managed retail jewelry stores in Canastota and Chittenango and was familiar with Ideal's products as he sold them in his shops. He was confident that the company could be even more successful. He looked into the prospect of moving the shop to Canastota and helped to arrange the deal. The Canastota Businessmen's Association put together a fundraising committee to buy the Marvin Drill Company building and the land it sat upon. Charles Rose had hoped to get the building for his company for free, but he settled for a promise from the association that ownership of the buildings and land would pass to Ideal if the company stayed in Canastota five years. William Hitchcock and his friends from Syracuse ended up buying control of Ideal in 1907. Ideal continued to grow, and there was a large market for their products. Departments and jewelry stores all over the country uh, would, would sell them. So the Ideal Cut Glass Company operated in Canastota from 1905 to 1933. This was one of the many businesses killed by the Great Depression, and larger companies could sell pieces more cheaply. They had customers worldwide. They didn't actually produce the glass themselves, but they used cutting wheels and glass designers to create pieces in nearly 80 different patterns. Diamond Poinsettia was their most popular. It was patented in 1913, and it was one of the most expensive produced. 
They also had a pattern featuring the USS Constitution, which was patented in 1927. Only 50 pieces with this pattern were produced. Patterns named after cities throughout the state, like Albany, Syracuse, and Utica, made it easier for consumers to relate to this product. So uh, here you go, here's a photo of the Diamond Poinsettia pattern. <laughs> here's a whole list of their other patterns. I'm not going to read these out to you, but as you can see, um, they were quite diversified. I've seen a lot of photos of, of these uh, pieces, and they're, they're beautiful. <laughs> so at the beginning, there were only a few employees, and as the business grew, more were hired to take the total up to over 100. A small cutting shop in Chittenango was also operated by Ideal briefly, beginning in 1910. This was the Chittenango Cut Glass Factory, closed in 1912 due to the difficulty in finding and training skilled workers. So here's an image of the Chittenango shop. Uh, I got this image from the Canastota Canal Town Museum. So Ideal, like I said before, didn't actually make the glass, but they purchased blanks and worked on cutting them. Um, they're heavy cut glass. This uh, involved blanks that they purchased from Corning or from Belgium. Blanks contained lead and they had thick walls and the entire surface would be decorated with deep incisions. Pieces included punch bowls, hair receivers, and glove boxes. Uh, their light cut glass uh, was produced by the Heise Company, uh, Newark, Ohio. This didn't contain lead, it had thin walls, and the decorations were shallow and didn't cover the entire surface. There were more variety in these pieces. Uh, they made stemware, baskets, candy dishes, lamps, even a lamp aquarium that held both water and fish. Glass cutting was a time-consuming process. It took a man about one day to cut a 10-inch berry bowl and two and a half days to cut the smallest punch bowl. Easier patterns on smaller pieces took less time, and the average pay for a cutter was $15 to $20, $22 per week. So here's that lamp aquarium. <laughs> so uh, let's learn how to create cut glass because, you know, we've all got lots of time right now in quarantine, so I know you guys are going to run out and try this. Uh, you need to select a quality blank. For a heavy cut, you want a thick wall to allow deep miter cuts to be mouth-blown and to contain a certain amount of lead oxide. Lead increases glass's clarity and the ability to refract light and its weight. Uh, it, soften, it softens the glass, it makes it easier to cut, and when you tap it, it rings like a bell. Blanks usually needed smoothing before the cutting could begin. Uh, the design would be placed on the blanks with paint or crayon. Stencils were used when Ideal started making matched pieces. Uh, you then create a pattern whose motifs have unity, and you join all parts together to produce a single effect. The design must have harmony. And uh, you really do need the work of a skilled craftsman. Uh, skilled craftsmen could cut, could cut deep, sharp designs to their pre-designed positions and dimensions. They created and maintained mirror-like surfaces with sharp, straight edges, which was called brilliant cut glass. All good things must come to an end. Um, there was an increase in wages for skilled labor. This became the largest expense for the company. European cutters would work for less, and it made it hard for Ideal and other American companies to compete with imported cut glass, which ended up being cheaper. In the late 20s and early 1930s, the quality declined. Cut glass fell out of fashion in the Depression, and some companies overproduced, failed, and flooded the crowded market with even more products. Cost-cutting measures um, included switching to pressed glass. The designs were simpler and didn't cover the entire surface, so there was less need for a skilled cutter. On March 14, 1933, Ideal filed a petition of bankruptcy in federal court. After the bankruptcy, the remains of the company were moved to the Watson Wagon Works building so the remaining orders could be finished. The last remaining cutters worked part-time for two years on this. The buildings that had once housed Ideal burned down in 1936. So glass is so central to our lives. Imagine where we would be without it. Um, thank you for listening to me talk about the history of glass as framed by the story of New York Canals. A uh, special shout out here to Joe DiGiorgio of the Canastota Canal Town Museum, who was a tremendous help uh, when I was putting together this talk a couple of years ago. Uh, when they reopen um, after all of this has passed, definitely go and give them a visit. They are a super cool museum. Um, and thank you guys for listening to me talk about glass and, and the history of glass and, and glass cutting and glass decoration on New York canals. Um, I hope you all stay safe and healthy, and thank you very much for supporting the museum at this very difficult time. Thanks.